what in the world am I doing up here? That was something I kind of started thinking about as I decided I wanted to do this and talk to Jason. He said, yeah, we want you to do it. I started to think back and what led me to this place. And if you'll bear with me today, one of the things we're going to do is I'm going to kind of tell you a little bit about my story because most of you know my story, at least um, my time here at Pineville Christian Church. Although I do have some friends that I'm very, very grateful that are here. They could probably attest to some of the other story I'm going to tell you. But most of the story today I'm going to give is about me and my journey. And as I thought about that, something came to mind, which is what a long, strange trip it's been. Now, I'm not a Jerry Garcia or Grateful Dead fan, but that popped in my head, and I thought, yeah, it's been kind of a broken road and what got me here and what brought me to this point today. So I wanted to share that. And then I also thought, as I've learned to know more and more about the Bible, that my story has a mirror of somebody else's story in the Bible. And a wise man once told me that everybody's story is in the Bible. And the more I thought about that, the more I found that to be true and why it's so applicable to today. All of your stories are in the Bible. Read through it and find your story. You will find it there. And the person's story who I relate to a lot is the Apostle Paul and the journey he took. Now, don't hear me wrong. I'm not comparing myself to one of the greatest Christians that ever lived, the man who wrote two-thirds of the New Testament. But what I am saying is there are definite parts of our story, particularly what brought us to Jesus, that are similar. So today's sermon is going to be me and Paul. Now, it's not the Willie Nelson song like Bob Miller and I love and have great taste in music and I salute him. But no, it's going to be a story of how our stories mirror each other. And like any story, we've got to start in the beginning. So we're going to start with Paul. Now, the Apostle Paul is known as Saul at Saul, the beginning of the Bible. But it's very common back then for them to have two names. I don't know if it was like a middle name and a first name or, or whatnot, but he was referred to Saul in the readings we're going to read, but then he became the Apostle Paul, and from that point, there's a point in the Bible on where they call him Paul. For my sakes, I'm going to call him Paul throughout the story, except when I'm reading from the verses. And he studied to become a rabbi. So Paul was drawn to God and wanted to become a rabbi and studied in Jerusalem. And in Jerusalem, he studied under... Gamil, I believe is how you say his name. I'm not sure. I probably should check this first. Is that right? No. No? What is it? Gamaliel. Gamaliel. I'm not going to be able to say that. So I'm going to say his teacher <laughs> was known as being kind of a compassionate teacher. There was two schools in Jerusalem at the time. And from what I've studied, which is outside of the Bible, but historical record, he was more of the compassionate of the two schools that Paul went there. And as you can imagine, as teachers do, we have many here, Paul had to have taken some of that on in his life. So you would think when he started studying God's word and studying under a good teacher, that he was heading on the right direction. Me, I'm Todd, I've always been known as Todd, except for my mother calling me Todd Wesley. And when that happened, I was not in a good place. But at least it used to be. Now, when she calls me that, it's more affectionate. But as you know, as a kid, if you hear your middle name, you're in trouble. Um, I didn't grow up with a family that we didn't attend church. That was not part of our lives growing up. But I did go to Catholic school. So why did I end up going to Catholic school if I didn't go to church? That would have been part of my life. Well, where I grew up in Toledo, at the time when I was set to go to school, the teachers went on strike. And my parents absolutely wanted me to start school on time and not behind because at the time they were talking about the strike lasting a long time. So they enrolled me and then subsequently my brother behind me. Um, into Catholic school. And then I did learn. My mom and dad always made sure I knew who God was and a little bit of Jesus and that. But in Catholic school, we you know I learned quite a bit. We chose baptism. We were quite older, but we chose to get baptized, my brother and I. And I went through First Communion. And one thing that always stayed with me is I learned the Lord's Prayer. We were taught that, and I remember it today and can recite it in a minute. So I had some things that stuck with me. And then I was taught by Frank and Susan Taylor, my parents, who you know, I could go on a whole sermon on, on how good of parents they were and all the things they did for me. And they did they did teach us about God. We knew some of the stuff, some of the things. And most importantly, what I can say about my mom and dad, I just texted them this recently, is they were servant leaders. And my brother and I learned to be the same. We grew up in a thing, sadly, we don't have as much today, and that's a community. 
where we helped our neighbors and our neighbors helped us and we all did it not because of giving and taking but because we all love each other and i grew up very much in a community like that where everybody helped everybody out my mom and dad taught me to be servant leaders so i started out very solid things in your programs i do have what we can write down for three reflective questions what i what i thought i'd do today is give me some questions to think about and take home and mull over and talk about a little bit. So my first question, kind of like as I was looking back, is what is your foundation based on? We all know here the importance of a foundation, right? The ground's constantly sinking here, and I hear all the time about, man, my foundation's cracked, or this house has been condemned because of bad foundation. So a foundation is of the utmost importance, including Jesus talking about, you know, upon this rock. I built my church when he was talking about you know, one of his apostles. He knows the importance of a foundation. But we all have to look at our foundation on a regular basis. I have to look through this. You're going to see my foundation in several different forms. Some solid, some decay, some crumbling. But I think it's important to think on a regular basis, what is your foundation based on? I think it's very important, obviously, that your foundation be based on Jesus Christ. Think about where he is. If you have cracks or anything, your foundation can stay solid if Jesus is a part of it. So think about that. If you're a parent, I particularly encourage you to talk to your children about what your foundation is based on. So they understand. Maybe they'll understand a little bit more when we get on them while we're talking to them about their foundation and why you need to do this and that. I'm sure at the time I didn't appreciate all the lessons Frank and Susan Taylor taught me. <laughs> But as an adult and a parent now, I can certainly understand the foundation they were laying. Now we're going to get off track a little bit like me and Paul did. We're going to go into the wilderness and see what areas, where things kind of went off the rails a little bit. So for Paul in the wilderness, this is going to be in Acts 7, 57, 58, you know, I'll read through. It's the first time that we see Saul in the Bible. And he's at the stoning of Stephen. Uh, Stephen was a Christian who was spreading the word and was trying to get out there what Jesus Christ was. And if you know, a lot of the Jews were that's blasphemous and you were in big trouble for doing that. So here we see Stephen and it says, At this they come to their ears and yelling at the top of their voices, they all rushed him, dragged him out of the city and began to stone him. Meanwhile, the witnesses laid their coats at the feet of a young man named Saul. So Saul is at the stoning death of a Christian. And not only is he there, he's a very important person there. Because you can imagine in the desert and stuff, you're not going to just give your coats up for somebody to keep their feet clean for no reason, right? Your coats are getting all dirty. We don't have no washers, dryers, things of that nature. But Saul was obviously a very important man because the people did that at his feet. It's been talked about, although you can't prove it, because he may have been in charge of the death of Stephen and leading that. So you can see, while he had started with a good foundation in some areas, he's you know, taken it too far. The next time we see Saul, he isn't, he isn't content to just do that, what he was doing in Jerusalem. He wants to take his show on the road. He wants to go out and stop this Christianity wherever he can stop it. Acts 9, 1 and 2. Meanwhile, Saul was still bringing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. He went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues in Damascus. So that if he found any there who belonged to the way, whether men or women, he might take them as prisoners to Jerusalem. So he's, he's persecuting, and when I say persecuting, it highly likely means death. Christians in Jerusalem, and for him, that's not good enough. I've got to stop this. I'm going to take this. I need, I'm writing letters. Can I come out to Damascus and get people, take them back as prisoners? And again, when I mean prisoners, it's likely a death sentence. And they say, yes, Saul, you can. So you can see at this point in time, I was not a Christian and, you know, not even a good person at this point in time. He is out there to persecute and kill people who are spreading the word of Jesus Christ. Now, I wasn't doing that, but I was not walking with Christ. We're going to start kind of in my 20s. And I thought the best way is maybe show you some pictures that kind of represent how I was in my 20s and when I was in the wilderness. And I think these were the best representations I could kind of come up to how I was. Um, 
my mom and dad moved overseas for my dad's job and me and my brother stayed back and we got a house together and then we lived what could be closest to real life of animal house you've ever seen. Um, we partied all the time. There are still stories back in the town that we lived in about me and my brother's parties in the house. Um, we lived for Fridays. We worked hard Monday through Friday at the machine shop. And we worked very hard, but come Friday when we clocked out, you know, had to have time to get, get a shower, and then there was probably already people waiting at our house when we got home. We did go to the bars on occasion, but most of the time they didn't because the bar was at my house. We had just unbelievable raised parties, and that's what I lived for. I lived for a good time in my 20s. If anybody needs references, I can give you references. I have a lot of stories. I always like to talk about Bob's stories. I'm like, I got a lot of stories. I just can't tell them on Sunday. <laughs> but, and you could also ask a young lady in the back who was probably at parties younger than she needed to be. I know she showed up a time or two at my house. I remember meeting her. And she could tell you how we kind of lived. And that went on for some time. And, uh, and um, so, you know, I wasn't like soft persecuted people, but I was definitely living with sin. Anything you could think about was happening at that house on Cleveland Street, of all places, that's where we lived on Cleveland Street. And then something happened in my life, in my later 20s, that kind of changed that for me. Anybody got any idea what that might be? It's a woman. <laughs> that's how most things change. I met, like I said, I met my wife many years before, but I was dating someone else at the time, so I just knew her. And then it went a few years where I didn't really see her, maybe a year, things like that. And then we ran into each other at a gas station, talked a little bit, and then, you know, had a little spark and things happened from there. And then things were changed for me. In fact, I kind of use, if you're familiar with the movie Unforgiven with Clint Eastwood, I kind of use this line sometimes about her. I say, my wife, she cured me, cured me of drinking wickedness. And that she did. Now, she did not nag me or tell me, in fact, she, you know, we still had parties from time to time and she would participate in those and whatnot. But, I say as I try to keep you know, she gave me something I wanted more, uh, you know, and I cherished more, and I, I wanted to change that, and I wanted to be in a sober state of mind when I was with her, at least most of the time. So, I kind of started changing things, and I stopped that party, and in fact, uh, one thing we did is I actually moved out of that town. I had to get away from it, because it was too much people wanted to still do that around me and all that, and I just had to get away. And that's when something else came into my life in my 30s, which is, so I still didn't get with God. I had a, a woman who was, you know, engaged to me, going to be my wife. But then I got a job that was something a little bit more than um, I had before, and I had aspirations and lived for doing well in that job. I suddenly changed from this party guy to I needed to live to do well in my job and accomplish things. In fact, this is kind of sort of what was most important to me, sadly, for a big portion of my 30s. A successful career was most important to me. I sacrificed a lot of things to get a successful career and would do whatever was asked of me. You know, I thought with that came number four, which was power and prestige. I thought I was, you know, I was prestigious in what I was doing and, and things of that nature. Number three was if the company laid a goal out, I was going to go get it. One thing I like to say is, a uh, uh, thing I talk about in companies is, watch that you don't drink the Kool-Aid, because I was drinking the Kool-Aid. And I'm not saying companies are all wrong with their goals and stuff like that, but I'm just saying companies are designed to make money, right? They talk about companies having a heart and stuff. Companies don't have a heart. Companies are entities. Humans have a heart. Companies are designed to make money, and that's what you're there for, and you should try and strive and all that, but you have to do it for the right things. I was doing it for the right things. I was doing that because I wanted four and five. And I would do whatever the company needed me to do. And then sadly, my family and friends came behind that. Work was most important to me. And that went on for some time uh, in Ohio. And then they flew me down to a place that I thought was pretty cool, because in February it was pretty nice here in Pineville, Louisiana. <laughs> and then I came back, I think, in March, April, I was doing some training. I'm like, man, this is great. They're back, we're still freezing back home. I'm outside walking in shorts and stuff. And I was offered an opportunity to get a, to get a promotion and come to Pineville, Louisiana. And luckily, through those things, which are, weren't always in the right order, that brought me to a great place. So 
I got a promotion in the management, came down to Pineville, Louisiana. And everything I would say in that ladder was going as planned as far as what I was making my top priority. I was doing well with the company. We had the best plant within the company in North America. So that was all going well. And I felt, you know, I was going to get opportunities to move up that ladder and achieve what I wanted. And then something changed. This happens in many places. We were doing well, and the boss that brought us here got promoted and had to leave. And I got a new boss. And what I could say is that, to be fair to him, we were just oil and water. We did not mix at all. We did not do well together at all. We did not see eye to eye. Well, the plant probably suffered because when I say we didn't get together, we were openly fighting in front of people. I'm not talking fist fighting, but we were button heads and disagreeing to a large manner. Those people that are here, friends of mine that work with me, I'm so gracious. They know I'm not afraid to say, speak my mind. Unfortunately, I should sometimes be quiet about it, but that's not something that's in me. I'll speak my mind even to my detriment. And things got all kinds of mashed up. I'm not saying he was right and I was wrong, or I was wrong and he was right. We just, it just wasn't going to work. And I was very, very angry because my priorities now were getting screwed up. Some of was, in my mind, keeping me from achieving my top three priorities. And things were going very poorly for me, both with my family and with my personal life, or my professional life, which was most important to me. Everything was falling apart. Of course, in my foundation, I didn't have Jesus to help steady me, so I was relying on me to come up with ways, which often just led to more and more fighting. So, my reflective question for this, as I think back about that time, and I think about what they are now, is what is motivating you, and is it worthwhile? I had to talk to a friend who's got to do a funeral today for, a, uh, unfortunately, a sad young man who overdosed and lost his life. And when we're talking about that, I talked about the dash. The dash is one of my favorite things, the favorite poems, which talks about your life, really, comes down between that headstone dash between the date you were born and the date you were, you were killed, or died, I'm sorry. So what is that dash? Why, is it motivating you for the right things today? Is it something not right? Don't, don't hear me wrong. I'm not saying it's not right to try and work well at your job and try to achieve a, a level of success in your job. The only thing I'm saying with me, and then you have to ask, is why are you doing that? I wasn't doing it for the right reasons, I can tell you that. You saw my reasons. They weren't the right reasons. So, I think it's probably important, again, parents, I ask you to talk to your children about this. What motivates you? Explain it to them. Maybe they'll understand a little bit when you're coming down on them, why you want to come down on them. Because what motivates us as parents, you want to see the best life for your children, right? So, I think that's a good reflective question. These are questions I'm not just posing to you. I've got a regular plan now to go back and look at these questions for me on a regular basis. So, but luckily, for Paul, before, and for me now, that's not how the story ends. We're going to go back to Paul and talk a little bit, if you guys want to read along and see the next most important thing, the, the day, the moment that Paul encounters Jesus Christ. He's Remember, and he's going to reveal a true purpose to it, remember he's on the road to Damascus going to kill Christians. As he neared Damascus on his journey, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord? Saul asked. I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting, he replied. Now get up and go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. The men traveling with Saul stood there speechless. They heard the sound, but did not see anyone. Saul got up from the ground, but when he opened his eyes, he could see nothing. So they led him by hand into Damascus for three days. He was blind and did not eat or drink anything. In Damascus, there was a disciple named Ananias. The Lord called to him in a vision. Ananias! Yes, Lord, he answered. The Lord told him, go to the house of Judas on Straight Street and ask for a man from Tarsus named Saul. 
for he is praying. In a vision he has seen a man named Ananias come and place his hands on him to restore his sight. <clears throat> Lord, Ananias answered, I have heard many reports about this man and all the harm he has done to your holy people in Jerusalem. And he has come here with authority from the chief priests to arrest all who call on your name. But the Lord said to Ananias, Go! This man is my chosen instrument to proclaim my name to the Gentiles and their kings and to the people of Israel. I will show him how he must suffer for my name. Then Ananias went to the house and entered it. Placing his hands on Saul, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road as you were coming here, has sent me so that you may see again and be filled with this Holy Spirit. Immediately something like scales fell from Saul's eyes and he could see again. He got up and was baptized and after taking some food, he regained his strength. So, I think we could all be in agreement that Saul would probably be the last person, if you read the Bible to that point, that you would pick to say, hey, he's going to go spread the word of Jesus Christ, right? But luckily, Jesus typically takes broken people and uses them for the good of his kingdom. I don't know if you've uh, been raised in church your whole life or not, but at some point in time, I think we all feel broken. But luckily, Jesus never gives up on us and shows us the way. And he did with Paul. And Paul went on to do great things, like we said. He established so many churches and wrote two-thirds of the New Testament. So many things to, to spread Christianity. He eventually was you know, killed for his beliefs. But he did it willingly because Jesus loved him and showed him. That's why I asked Daniel then to sing that song, I Saw the Light. Beside it being one of my most favorite songs of all time, and I was with Brother Herbert. I was tapping my foot. I, I love that song anytime I hear it. And I always think of Saul when I think of that song because that's what it must have been like being there. And, you know, just on a separate note, can you imagine what it was going to be like to be Ananias? Sometimes we've got to listen to God even when we don't want to do what he's telling us to do. And great things come of it. So luckily, Paul was saved. Now we're going to kind of talk about when Jesus came and saved me. The moment, the, the, the hour that it happened. I hope as I go through this, you don't think that I'm imagining anything. I can tell you wholeheartedly, I'll never forget that day. It was the most important day in my life with all due respect to my family, but it saved me and my family. And it occurred just as I'm about to tell you it occurred. So I told you, me and this manager did not get along and fought often. And I can't remember this exact instance of what happened, but I know that day something happened and we really had it out for each other. And I don't know what's going to happen. I don't know if I'm going to be fired or, or you know, he's going to do something. But I'm just so mad throughout the day and getting angrier by the moment that this happened. The end of the day came and I didn't lay hands on him or nothing, so I wasn't fired yet, but you never know. And I had to drive home, which was about a five minute drive from the plane. And in that five minutes, I didn't have any time to calm down. If anything, I was more angry about it. Because I'm thinking, man, who is this guy and why is he screwing with what's most important to me? He has screwed up all the plans I have. And I'm extremely mad. I go in the house, I'm sure, I would think Brendan doesn't remember this. He's probably about he was seven or eight or nine. And he asked me something. It was probably about homework or something. And sadly, I do recall how I responded, which was very terse and probably included some curse language about it. I didn't give it about what, whatever that was. I just, that's who I was at the time, and that's what came out of my mouth. I went back to the bedroom, and I quickly changed clothes. At the time, I was walking quite a bit, and I grabbed my, my iPod, because that's what I listened to, and I was out the door without talking to anybody else. Probably with all good intentions of, I'm going to get rid of this anger, I'm going to go out here and think about this. But that didn't happen. As I'm listening to my iPod, I most like to listen to the hard rock music because that's a lot what I listen to and I still listen to some but, and if anything I'm getting angry. I'm walking I set uh, I don't know it's not the four minute mile but whatever it was for me that two miles I covered was fast because <laughs> so I'm walking brisk and mad and I, I know I'm making fists and clenching my fists at times thinking about the situation and how dare he do this to me and why is this happening and tell you, you know, just like, if I could, I would have put hands on him at any time. That's how angry I was at times. And when I get back to the house, I'm even angry. I remember walking in and Jasmine asking me something 
um, most likely what I wanted for supper. And unfortunately, again, I sadly remember that I responded to her with some terse language and some terse words because that's not, I could not think straight. My anger was completely controlling me at the time. And I went back to the bedroom and I slammed the door so nobody was coming in to see me. And I'm now like a mad dog. I, I still envision myself with spit coming out of my mouth. I'm so angry. Going back and forth in front of my bed, how dare he, I, I want to end this person. I, I used the word hate, has to be the word that it was at the time. I, I don't, I'm not there anymore, but at the time I completely hated him and I wanted to see this end by any means possible. Back and forth in front of the bed, about to lose it. And then the miracle happened for me. And there were several parts to it, although it was only a matter of a minute or two. I, I say sometimes I don't know what happened, but I know what happened. I was put on my knees at the edge of the bed, and I did something that I hadn't done since I can remember, and that's I prayed. And I prayed the simplest prayer anyone could ever pray in their life. With complete anger in my heart and everything, I just said, God help. Um, and luckily for me, he did. Like I said, the next few things are... You know, somewhat supernatural. They happened, though. I can tell you this. I can, uh, it's as clear today as it was when it happened. First and foremost, I felt unequivocally, while no one else was in the bedroom with me, a hand on my shoulder. Now, as a parent, you know how important it is when a kid's having a meltdown or something like that, just a hug or a pat on the back or something. But I felt clearly what felt like a hand on my shoulder. And... You know, in a calming manner, not like I grabbed my shoulder, I didn't go this, but a calming manner, which was so important to me. And then I heard the words that changed my life. I think I heard them audibly. Gus and I have been talking about it lately. Do you hear, you know, does God speak to people? I absolutely believe he does because I believe he spoke to me that day. Now, I don't know if it's audibly or it was heard in my ear and my heart, but I heard these words. It's all right. I have other plans for you. And I didn't know what that meant, um, but I heard it clear, clear as day. Those were the words that suddenly someone had spoken to me. That would have been a miracle enough for me. But I tell you this next part because this is the most important part of it and why I know it was Jesus that was there with me that day. I spoke to you about how much anger I had and how much I was filled with a desire to personally hurt somebody or even end them. Suddenly, my storm was completely calm. I felt a peace and calm that I've never felt before or after in my life. All that anger was completely gone and I could think straight for a few minutes at least. I'll never ever forget that experience. And I'm so glad that experience happened. The, uh, the next few minutes were like, what, 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 what? I'm sitting on the bed, you know, not knowing what had happened to me. But it had happened to me. And then finally being able to go out. And again, I don't think Brendan remembers this. He might remember that. I don't think he does. I went and apologized to him. Of course, he's seven or eight. I, not, I didn't explain this to him at the time. This is actually the first time he's heard this story, I believe. But he's seven or eight, and I, I apologized to him. And it was not right for me to do. It was not towards him. And, and I apologized to Jasmine, and I brought Jasmine back into the bedroom to explain to her what just happened to me. And then I also knew very clearly, because God had given me peace of mind and clarity, what I needed to do next. And several years before, a good friend of mine who's here today, and he knows this because I told him this, invited me and my family to come to Pineville Christian Church. That's not where I was. So, I, you know, oh, thanks, man. That's really not... A, to us and all that, but I remember that. I'm so glad that John invited me. So the first thing I told Jasmine you need to do is you need to call Tiffany and find out what time they go to church because we're going to go to Pineville Christian Church with them. And the next Sunday, my family and I were at Pineville Christian Church. And then from that day to this. Now I ain't got another four hours to tell you about all this stuff that happened between that day to this, but that's kind of what led me to this today. Many things have happened between then, but those were the key factors that led to the most important moment of my life 
and then to come here to Pineville Christian Church and now to the point where I want to share the gospel and how much God has done for me. You know, when I told you this, I said this was the story and it, the story's about me and Paul, but there's something that's wrong with this title. Does anybody know what might be wrong with this title? The story is not about me and Paul. The story was all leading up to about Jesus. Jesus is what's important in the story. Our story is all ancillary to what he wants to tell and what he wants to have to happen in the world. So my last reflective question as we wrap up really is, how is your story about Jesus? That, I, I'm, I'm not going to lie to you. I hope you get, guys think about it and stuff. Man, that story, I'm still struggling with that. Reflective question myself. Every moment, every day, you know, is my story about Jesus? Am I showing people the right things? Am I, am I helping to bring anybody to God and, and to share his word? If you're here today, your story should be about Jesus. Think about it. Man, talk to your, your kids about it. I, I'm not exactly sure about the conversation I'm about to have with my family, but I've been thinking about it for quite a while and with these reflective questions and what I'm going to tell Brendan and things of that nature. But that's an important question we should reflect on on a regular basis. In fact, you know, that one I'm going to continue to think about every day. So I tell you all this not to say, you know, I've been thinking this through. Because the times I'm going to be like, oh, I don't want to be this about, oh man, Todd had this, and it's about Todd, or, you know, he, he's, he's special, he's chosen, and then I, I realized I was wrong, because I am special. And what I mean by that is we're all special. And we're all chosen. Me included. If you're here, if you believe that Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior, you are the chosen one. So, go and take that message and give it to others. Don't get down I bet John, John and Tiffany were probably surprised to all get out like, where did this come from? It was two years that John asked me that. All of a sudden she texted Tiffany or called Tiffany and suddenly we wanted to come to church. So, you know, go out there and try and spread the word and invite people. Don't get down if they don't come. Eventually, God will pick the right timing. It's not a hard timing, it's on his. So, let's go ahead and pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for all that you do in our lives. Lord, I thank you for showing me the light. I thank you for showing all of us the light at some point in time in our lives, or to show us the light when we lose our way. You are what we need to live for, what we need to be for, and what we need to reflect in the world. Imprint it in our hearts that we can go forward and be servants of you and your kingdom. In your name we pray. Amen. Well, that's it. That's the first one. I don't know about the last one.